Welcome back to the show, folks. This is the Agency Freedom Podcast. We help insurance professionals move from captivity to freedom. Our guest for this episode is Mr. Trent Warner, and he is, uh, what is exactly your title there, Trent? Uh, Grand Poobah co-founder? What, what do you go by these days? <laughs> I think of it as a managing director. I am orchestrating the strategies and, and leading clients to profitability. Okay, sweet. Love that. He's the managing director of Strategic Brand Builders. This episode is all about marketing. We're going to talk about big picture. We're going to get into some AI topics. We're going to get into what it means to hire a a marketing agency and and what you should be thinking about as you're considering that. What are the big picture things that a professional marketing firm can do for your agency to take things off of the executive's plate and put them in the hands of a highly qualified professional? Uh, That's basically where this episode is. So for you folks out there that really love a good marketing episode, we're going to get all the way in the weeds on this one, baby. So uh, Trent, I'm going to hand you the microphone, man. You have extensive background in the insurance industry. Why don't you give us the, the brief rundown on how you got to this point in your career and why you chose to be doing what you're doing with strategic uh, market builders? I love that. James, thanks for Brand builders, sorry. Brand builders. Strategic brand builders. Thank you for having me. So I started my marketing career actually as a blogger. I got my foot in the door with my first marketing business. And a client posed a question for me. What's this doing? I see that we're writing. This is in the era of keyword stuffing. They didn't really understand all of it. So I went down the rabbit hole with really understanding what marketing did for businesses' bottom lines. That started with an independent insurance brokerage. I ended up working with some bigger names in the game, AIG Travel Guard and some others. And what what I saw in working at various marketing agencies is they were selling a lot of tactics that weren't rooted in a strategy that actually accomplished business goals. They were busy with marketing, but they weren't super effective. So when I started my first marketing agency, that's what I set out to do, help businesses that were heavy in compliance, finance, insurance, real estate, and law. We've since made an adjustment in the last two years, really doubling down on that strategy. And that's where we sit today. We sit at the center of strategy and help businesses effectively deploy marketing. We're going to talk about AI in a little bit, but I think that it's just being aware of what's in the space the marketing deliverable ends up being a little bit of a commodity. A lot of different people can fulfill it. But if that strategy isn't solid, if you're not building on a good foundation, marketing just doesn't work. Yep. Yeah, and I go to your website, strategicbrandbuilders.com, which we're going to put in the show notes here. And I love seeing the assumptions that people bring to the conversation. You know, just like in our industry, as of course you're very well aware, uh, the the deliverable, the insurance policy, the the end result, the brand kit, the SEO package, or whatever it is that you end up doing and putting in someone's hands, that's not the secret sauce. It's like handing someone a a highly technical industrial tool, but then not showing them how to use it, not showing them exactly what it's for and what it can do for you. Tell me a little bit about the the philosophy, the assumptions that you bring to the marketing conversation uh, in, in, in 2023 and beyond. What is it that is so important about the work that you do advising your clients beyond just the deliverables that your firm puts in their hands? Yeah, the way we start is we do a lot of research and that's to build up your brand. And it's not to start with a logo. I think that a lot of people go, brand, I need a logo. People are gonna try to sell me a creative logo. It's a cute logo, right? It, It needs to work for your business. When I think about brand, I think about two things, building trust and having a great customer experience. And those are two things that any insurance agency can do. And they can do that without a logo. It's what makes you different in the space and how do you have a great customer experience all the way through? It's what sets independent insurance brokerages far apart from carriers. No, I love that, man. And, and far apart from carriers could not be further from the truth, especially in the IA channel, where it seems like the carriers have absolutely no idea how to market themselves. They are still <laughs> marketing exactly like they did you know, 15 years ago. And hey, what do you know? Five years ago, they got around to doing pay-per-click social media ads. <laughs> oh, that's really exciting. 
you know, that was only a, a new and cool thing in like 2013, 2014. <laughs> it's like in the last two or three years, it's like COVID comes around and I see all these ads for carriers pop up at my newsfeed and I'm like, oh, you guys finally discovered pay-per-click. Congratulations. Way to get on social where we've been for the last 10 years. Good job. Yeah. So the, the agility of the IA channel, I think, is one of our biggest advantages. Sometimes information overload is a real problem, obviously, but our ability to take in something, make an adjustment, and deploy it at scale, I, I think, is one of the best things that the IA channel has. Uh, what has been your experience in leveraging working with a small business that can adjust course, that can take your advice, that can look at data, and and I don't know what your philosophy is on data versus the look and feel, quantitative versus qualitative. Uh, feel free to get into that if you want to. But how do you help in, independent agents be more agile and make more sound tactical decisions with their marketing? I think the first thing is thinking locally, right? Like a big carrier can never get as localized as an independent insurance agency can. So that's the main one. Like how can you talk to, if you're selling landlord insurance, building owner insurance, how can you talk to those people in your neighborhood? How can you meet with the real estate agents that are more upstream from you and help them with their work? I think about it as being genuine and making a connection and carriers can't do that at scale. One thing that I see carriers do all the time that I hope most in independent insurance brokerages laugh at is those social media stacks that they give them. And they're like, hey, repost our blog on homeowners insurance that links back to the traveler's website or whatever. It's not going to help your business. Oh, man. No, I, I, I love it when that I only have those conversations once with every rep in our in our carrier portfolio because I only have to have it once because <laughs> the very first time they ever suggest it, I lean in and very slowly and deliberately say, I will never repost <laughs> anything your carrier puts out ever. Yeah. I, it, it's like, what part of independent agent do you not understand? The moment I put out something that's carrier branded, my insurance is going to be like, what? What is, it, what is this? You lose trust, right? Yeah. And when you have the entire landscape to place people in and you just start promoting individual carriers, you lose yeah. their trust. Yeah. So that's definitely one thing I see in the space. I've also worked on some campaigns where a carrier will have like a direct quote platform and they're like, stick this iframe on your website. But what happens to all of those people that fill out that form, but don't end up converting with the end carrier? You lose all of those leads. Yeah. So it, it makes yeah. much more sense for you to put out your own ads, get those initial contacts. And those initial contacts year over year actually become the compound interest for insurance brokerages, yeah. right? Because this is the only real industry where insurance is cyclical. You know when they're buying again. You know when their policy is up for renewal based on when they reached out to you. And in most cases, if they were to leave, it could be to no fault of your own, right? Maybe they couldn't get placement one year. But two years from now, you can still reach out to that person and say, Hey, I'd love to give you a policy review. Yeah. And they, there are so many agents that make their entire living on working their ex dates and just talking to people they talked to last year and the year before and the year before who didn't say yes then. But at the end of every conversation, they have one little tiny question that's terribly important. Hey, next year when this comes back around, do you mind if I give you a call and try to help you again? And of course, Absolutely. if they say yes, and who's not going to say yes to that? Unless you're a complete jerk and the insurer just like, never call me again. <laughs> I never want to talk to you. You suck. I'm actually going to tell my friends to not work with you because you suck so bad. <laughs> Outside of that very rare situation, everybody's going to say, yeah, sure, you can call me next year. I don't care. Absolutely. And that goes back to the first two things I talked about, trust and customer experience. You're building that right. trust over time. You're providing value. And having that phrase in your overall path with a client, it's great customer experience. They want to know that you care and that you're not just about that sale. Yeah. What are along those lines, before we jump to the AI thing, because I know you have some strong opinions there. What are one or two really just high level 
common mistakes that you see independent agents make when when you start I mean, maybe with your intro call or you're doing just early stage discovery with a potential new client when you go ooh, ooh please don't do that 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 what you're doing right there that's a bad idea don't ever do that yeah to stay above the rabbit hole and not talk seo or anything like that i'd say mm -hmm. I see two yeah. big problems in the space and the first is having a solid foundation I see a lot of businesses layer on tactics onto a broken website. And it's like trying to build a, si a skyscraper in a bog, right? Like you have these aspirations of building something really tall, but mm -hmm. the foundation just isn't there. So having a website that plays to Google's best practices, speed, accessibility, SEO, I'll only mention it one time, uh, that's really important to make sure that all of the tactics that you layer on thereafter work for your business and your marketing budget is actually effective and not just a waste. No, this, I definitely agree. Go yeah, ahead. Sorry, this, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, 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 you're good. The second thing I see is going for tactics instead of a strategy. So a strategy is that bridge between your business goal and your marketing plan. Saying that you want to grow your business X amount per year identifying that your sales timeline is inefficient or you have a high churn or anything like that, that's a business goal that you want to fix. And a marketing plan and a marketing tactic does that, but bridging that gap with a strategy so that it's deployed effectively is really important. And it's a piece I see a lot of people miss. They think I have to do video or I have to be on social or I should be doing pay-per-click. It really has to relate back to a business goal that you're trying to solve or else you're going to be on a hamster wheel every year going, was I effective? Did I mm -hmm. get the thing that I set out to do? Is that done? Well, one of the things just for, for you out there, Freedom Jumper, listening to this episode, if you're wondering why are we leaving SEO in a box on the shelf, there, there's two reasons that I have. And Trent, of course, probably has his own reasons. The first of which is we want to make sure that these episodes stay relevant for a really long time. And there's nothing that changes faster than search engine optimization. <laughs> we could record this and we could get all the way in the weeds on SEO and 90 days from now, all it takes is one major shift in the algorithm and everything we just told you is completely wrong uh, because it's, it's outdated. And that goes for Google as well as YouTube and TikTok and all the other algorithm-based search optimization platforms. So, uh, that and, and then the other thing is most people just don't know enough about the building blocks of how all of that SEO stuff happens anyway. They don't necessarily understand that it's only the written word. It's only HTML and CSS code. And it's a little robot that literally crawls the code of your website and finds stuff that the images that are on the visual representation of your website these robots can't see unless they're tagged and descriptive and all the things that happens with SEO. Most people don't understand that it's too technical. It doesn't really lend itself to the, the method of communication that a podcast or even a video podcast is for those of you watching on our YouTube channel. Trent, anything you want to add there about why we don't talk about SEO in this kind of forum? I also think that I, I don't even sell just SEO anymore. I think sure. of it as like really organic as a whole. And when we think about things like backlinks, so having other people link to your website, it's about making a connection. So I sell things that are organic. It's how can I introduce your business to people upstream from you where you can collaborate on a real and online level to actually do something for your business, not just in a vacuum. I think SEO sits in a vacuum and it bores people and it's not sexy and it yep. takes a long time to actually do the right way. But if you could get introductions to people that are upstream from you and they can help you and we can do complimentary things on your website to increase your visibility, because at the end of the day, it's SEO is about increasing your visibility and traffic. And the other things that lead to engagement and conversions aren't necessarily a part of SEO. So I think of it as the totality of organic. Makes sense. It, from my perspective, it really boils down to it's a lame podcast episode that most people don't want to listen to. <laughs> so that's the reason why, for, for me personally, aside from it not being future proof at all, yeah. I just know that it, I would get comments or messages going, what was that? Don't do an episode <laughs> like that again. I, I turned it off 10 minutes in. That was terrible. So just to pivot here, because there there's... 
this consistency bias that I find, I, I just find myself going back to over and over and over again. I'm a, I'm a marketing wonk from, from here to Timbuktu, man. To me, it all, it all starts with vision and mission and core values and making sure that what, the way that we present our brand to the marketplace, that it is reliable, that it's, it's predictable, like Nike or Kroger grocery store or whatever. Like when people see that little RW with a box around it, I want them to think something. Really, I want them to feel something. Uh, talk about the power of consistency because on your website here, I see strategy and then branding and then SEO and then website design. And then after all four of those things are done, Everything else, all of the content, the collateral, the stuff that people's eyeballs and ears are actually going to engage with happens after all four of those things are done. Let's talk about the power of consistency for a little bit, and then we're going to get into the deep end of the pool with the AI stuff. I love it. So a lot of people, when they do marketing, their goal is leads, right? Like you want an ROI on your marketing investment, but leads are a byproduct of everything that happens ahead of that. Before you get leads, you need visibility. You need to be seen. Bef and after you get seen, you need traffic. You need people to go, that's that thing that I want. I'm going to click. I'm going to go to the website. Once you have people on the website, you need them to engage. Not every time that's going to be a conversion. If you have a blog, it doesn't mean you're going to get a conversion. But if you have a blog that then links to the landing page that has a form on it, now we're getting closer to that conversion. So I think of a path of marketing, visibility, traffic, engagement, and then conversions. It's really the process. And you can't skip any part of the process and just jump to leads. No, it, it definitely is, is a linear thing. Like I, I like how you have it laid out there. It starts with strategy. And I like how you describe the difference between strategy and, and tactics. The way that I've always described it and the difference between the two is strategy is the plane is at 38,000 feet traveling. Tactics are the plane is on approach for landing. It's it's a thousand feet off the ground and it's you know doing what it does. So the uh, the relationship between the two is really important to, to get nailed for sure. Yeah. So, tactics can change over time right? Like the overarching strategy, that is the pathway to get you to your goal. You might have different stops on the way. The market might change. You talked about the algorithm earlier. That might change, but the strategy of getting you there needs to be the constant. You need to work towards something. So uh, I see making adjustments to tactics. I see making adjustments to the marketing plan, but the overall business goal and the strategy needs to be a constant. No, I totally agree. Let's uh, let's jump into the deep end, shall we? AI is probably the buzzword of 2023 as, it, as a year. Like, I don't know if there's any word that comes in the little word cloud thing that's going to be bigger than AI. It seems like every single thing that a vendor is pitching me is AI enabled, powered by AI. It's like, what does that mean? in the context of a marketing plan and the, the entire ecosystem. Obviously, we all can think of the, the simple things like, hey, can ChatGPT write my blog for me? Well, probably yes, but you definitely want to put some soul into it and have some revisions that are actually human because ChatGPT definitely sounds like it was written by a high school junior most of the time. <laughs> and so I. Maybe I'm a little bit harsh there, but it does not really have any zhuzh to it. Um, but thinking in a bigger sense, when you think about future-proofing marketing as a, as a practice, how do you do that in the context of generative AI and what that becomes over time? It's really interesting. I think AI is the buzzword of 2023, 2024, and 2025. I don't think we're near the end of hearing it every single day, in every single email, half of the social posts. I think of it as a great tool. I think of it as a way to enhance, but I don't think of it as the end-all, be-all for what you're doing. I don't think that a lot of marketing jobs will get replaced by it. I think maybe the bottom 
I think that the floor in general will be raised with AI. And that also means the ceiling will be raised with AI. I think it's a great first draft, but like you said, it can't live on its own. I think that it enables a lot of people. It's going to be like going from the hand drill to the power drill, right? There's going to be some people who drag their feet and say, what I do is an art and I'm going to do it my way forever. They're probably going to get outpaced because... Yeah. The, the cost there is going to be in manpower. And I think that there's a lot of interesting things that I see that really go back to that customer experience. I think of recording meetings, right? And there's a lot of AI that takes your note taking away for you. I use an AI tool, Grain AI, and it sits in the background of my meetings. And after the meeting, I get the key takeaways and the responsibilities that each person said, because it can see when you're talking and when I'm talking. And it'll say, James said that he's doing these three things next week. And Trent said he's doing these three things. I think it's going to save a lot of time for a lot of manual effort. But someone's got to use it. Someone has to deploy it effectively. And I think that there's going to be a lot of people who find their niche in doing that. And they're going to be wildly successful. No, I absolutely agree with that. And, and I can't take credit for this quote. Uh, one of the things that I've heard said by several thought leaders in the space is you may not be replaced by AI, but if you refuse to innovate, you will absolutely be replaced by someone who is utilizing generative AI because they'll simply be able to operate faster than you at a scale that you can't keep up with because your wait for it. Your brain is not as fast as an AI brain. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I sat in on an AI conference the other day, and it was specifically for CMOs and how they see the marketing space getting disrupted. And they said about 10% of your time and budget should be in exploring how AI can be integrated into your business. And yeah. then there's a path to actually develop that into your organization over time. And the first is learning at the top, right? The person yeah. who's leading the organization, they need to figure out whether or not it can be impact, like their roles can be impacted, the people below them can be impacted. And once you've figured out maybe some of these operational things that can be uh, adjusted or enhanced with AI, then it's how do we cascade this organization wide? And I think that that's something really interesting to think about. And the executives, the people that are in the decision-making chairs near the top of the org chart, are the ones that have the most responsibility to be thinking about these threats to standard operating procedure. You know, when it comes to marketing, what are one or two suggestions you would have for our listening audience on steps that they can take to start to wrap their arms around the big scary thing that is AI? A lot of people listening to this podcast are early stage agency owners and sales professionals, but a lot of folks have been around for a long time. Uh, there, there's plenty of gray hairs in the listening audience who may be less than thrilled at the idea of learning a completely new, not just platform, but completely new ecosystem of technology. Mm. I'd say start small, right? Start with some of the tasks that you can just throw in there just to learn it. It's like getting that computer. I feel like a lot of people who are really up in arms about it still have their fax machine number and their email signature, right? Yeah. Uh, we're, not, we're not using that anymore um, for the most yeah. part. I don't, I don't know many people. Unless you're a lender or a title company and God <laughs> help you because we work with a ton of real estate investors and we get, you know, 15 e-faxes every single day. And I was like, what's the difference between an e-fax and an e-mail? If the e-fax is delivered via email, I don't understand. Can someone please help me? Why are we still doing it this way, folks? Let's go. So to your point, yeah, there's there's definitely opportunities to, to start small. Uh, any platforms you want to give a shout out to that you're particularly fond of that are more accessible to less experienced, less perhaps sophisticated users that want to get into it? Yeah, I, I love ChatGPT4. So I've used a ton of different writing platforms, Jasper, ChatAI, the like of that. I, I think ChatGPT4 is great for its price point. It doesn't need to be a, a multi-hundred dollar a month thing for you. And just try a couple of things in there. It doesn't even need to be work related for you to get your feet wet in it. Something that I enjoyed when it first came out, I was an early adopter. I put in a list of things that I like eating and I said, make my meal plan for the week. And it gave me a grocery list at the end and it made a whole meal plan. And it's just 
just figuring out how to use the tool, just play around with it. It doesn't need to be the boogeyman. Mm -hmm. uh, outside of that, I'd find something where if your business allows you to have um, something to sit in your meeting to take notes, try Otter, try Grain, something like that, and just see a tool enabled by AI that will save you time in your note taking, in your email follow-ups. Um, use it for writing emails, those cumbersome emails that aren't necessarily, um, they don't have personal information or anything in it. Things like that, I think that are super mm. helpful. It's, it's really the next step of marketing automation, right? The, yeah. You automated a lot of things with marketing automation. If you're not using marketing automation right now, that's a, a totally separate podcast episode that you and I could go down. But uh, you're, you're saving time and you're being efficient. Think of it yeah. in that way. Don't think of it as this thing that's going to replace you. Man, if you're not using marketing automation, that face I just made for those of you watching <laughs> on the uh, on the video podcast is, whew, oh, sorry, you're, you're years behind the curve. Like, I don't know, four or five, six years behind. Let's go. Come on, chop, chop. You're using marketing automation, right, folks? Get after it. So. <laughs> I have so many fun tactics with marketing automation that, you know, really create a compound interest for businesses yeah. that uh, I think are super important. So when I look at your website and I go through the content and just to get the philosophical side of things, to get the assumptions that you guys bring to the conversation, it a lot of times it comes down to a business decision. And like any other consultant, like any other third party strategic partner, vendor, whatever, when it's this level of involvement, I think of this in terms of payroll, honestly. It's like hiring a firm like yours, hiring a, a, an advisor like Trent Warner is just another version of payroll. So when I go to your website and I see where you have that part down there about halfway down and it says, how much does this cost? One. Bravo for being clear about how much it cost on average. You've clearly read Marcus Sheridan's book, They Ask You Answer, and, and being very transparent with most people's most important question is, can I even afford to consider working with you? When, when people are going through the due diligence process, how do you want them to be thinking about the idea of hiring a marketing agency that in effect is, uh, and maybe this is not in effect, maybe this is explicitly what you're doing. It's a fractional CMO. You're basically outsourcing a critical marketing advisory and creative and design component for your agency folks. So of course it's going to be expensive. Uh, Trent, how do you want people to be thinking about the spend on an agency like yours? It's an investment, right? Like I think of there's only two ways to scale a business, like truly get away from time input, money output, and that's operations and marketing. Your website's your 24 hour salesperson. It can be a sales engine. For most yeah. businesses, it's an online business card because it's not fueled effectively. Marketing is one of the few things that your business can spend money on that gets great ROI at scale. And if you're not marketing, I think that you're missing out on a, a key component of your business and mm -hmm. not having a marketing strategy. You're playing marketing whack-a-mole. Your mm -hmm. marketing team, probably an associate, maybe a writer. They're very busy, but are they effective? I've seen websites with 400 blogs that still generate no traffic. It's yeah. not rooted in a strategy. So um, we, we're very transparent about marketing. That comes back to building trust and customer experience. It's We want you to know what you're getting into. I think that for a lot of people that are afraid to spend $5,000 a month on marketing, but they're still doing marketing, I'd ask how effective it is. I'd ask, like, are you consistently getting leads? Is there clarity and consistency in your messaging? Can you look at the landscape and go, this is my target audience and here's how I'm differentiating from my competitors with many yeah. competitors in the insurance space with much bigger budgets than independent insurance brokerages. So yeah. how do you effectively stand out? Well, I think finding your lane to travel in is, is an extremely important part of what you guys can help them with, like creating and crafting a, an ideal client profile and figuring out who do you want to be going after? Like the very first part of marketing, right? Is who's your audience? 
yeah. who, who is who is going to be consuming this? Because it, correct me if I'm wrong here. This I'm not a marketing professional. I'm, I'm just a business owner. My very first thought when I am building my brand and risk wall has been meticulously thought out and considered in ways that would make most people's eyes roll back in their head is like, good God, why, why are you spending so much time thinking about such a small piece of this? It's like, because this is the foundation that everything else gets built on. And if this isn't perfect for what we want it to be, then all the other stuff, to use your analogy of building a skyscraper on top of a swamp, well, your foundation sucks. So everything else that you build on top of it is going to be suspect. Um, how How do you go about the process of coming alongside the, these clients of yours and helping them make sense of what should I be doing? Like, how do I pick a niche? Like, where do I need to focus my marketing? Like, obviously that's not entirely your job. A lot of it is going to be the agency deciding for themselves. What do I like? What do I want to talk about? What kind of person do I want for a client? You can't do that for them, of course, but you guys are definitely involved in that conversation, I would imagine, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for a lot of our clients, that need a foundation, we start with research. So we walk hand in hand with the business owner and maybe they're number two, maybe it's their operations person, whatever. Uh, and we go through six weeks of research with them, one hour a week, and it explores a different part of their business. So we start with understanding their unique value proposition and we revisit that value proposition after every subsequent meeting. The next meeting, we explore their competitors, what they wanna emulate and avoid about the space. Every business owner has something. There's something that you love about your industry and there's something that makes you turn your nose at some brands within it, right? Uh, after that, we talk about your target audience. So we go from who your competitors are, who they're targeting and who you wanna target. Then we talk about your brand personality, how you wanna be represented online and in general, the look, feel, voice and tone. Something that when you give your marketing to us or someone else or internally, it's all uh, clear and consistent throughout everything that you do. And I won't go too deep into the psychology of the next one, but we talk about brand archetypes. Everybody needs a car, but people gravitate towards certain brands of cars. And it's because these, uh, these car companies do a really good job of making you see yourself in that vehicle before you buy it. The person who buys a Jeep is very different than the person who buys a Mercedes. So we do this mirroring element of your ideal customer and how they see themselves working with you. So that's a little bit on the research, but I think it really gets to the crux of all of the different elements that make your business unique and how it's represented in the space. And that can't be done in a single day. I've had a lot of business owners after one exercise, the week after that, when we have our next meeting, they have this passion. They've they're fallen in love with their business again because they can finally see it actually coming to life in a way that's meaningful for them. Yeah. So I really enjoy that time because it really gets a business owner to get out of their get for, out from behind their desk and really think about their business in an exercise that they're led through. One of the things that we've been experiencing the last few weeks um, at Riskwell, as this episode airs, it's probably two or three months that we've been going through this, is refocusing our entire you know, collective thought energy as an office. There's nine of us here at Riskwell in, in total, including my wife and I and, and seven team members. But we have gotten away over the course of 2023, and it was a very gradual process. It didn't intentionally happen this way, but we got away from thinking in terms of revenue. And revenue is the lifeblood of every company, of course, but especially insurance agencies where annual recurring revenue, I mean, decisions you make today have exponential impact on lifetime value of an account. So we've we've refocused all of our energy on where are we driving revenue? How are we able to maximize the revenue from an individual account that comes in? So as we think about marketing, as we think about how do we craft all of these pieces, the, the, the blogs, the video, the branding, the SEO, the website design, is our website good for conversion? Are we giving people what they think they want when they click onto riskwell.com? 
everything that you're talking about is literally what we've been experiencing and perhaps not doing the very best of, of jobs. When when someone like like me, we've been around for four and a half years now, we have a very good idea of what we want. We already have a website designer, Advisor Evolved does a great job with that. How does someone like me come along the, the opportunity uh, that you and, and your team put out there? How do we begin to digest, well, I'm already doing all of these things. I recognize that I need to be doing better. How do I go about engaging with you or even considering engaging with you? Because there's already so much momentum that is existing. There's, there's so many moving parts in every retail insurance agency Help me make sense of it, because I'm asking for myself as much as for my audience. How do we go about saying, yeah, I recognize there's probably better ways to do some of these things, but I don't know how. Like, how do, mm -hmm. how do we make sense of how to get started when the machine is already moving so quickly? Yeah, that's a great question. So building a marketing foundation is one aspect of what we do. The next is really strategy and scale. So I think of the marketing foundation as taking your marketing from zero to one. And the next part is taking your marketing from one to 10. So there's probably some component around like, what's my annual goal for next year? How do I break this into a quarterly roadmap? And how do I make sure that that roadmap tracks back to my business goals and effectively gets accomplished? Because I'm sure you know, if you're doing your own marketing, there's a lot that comes up along the way. There's a lot that requires subject matter expertise. And that's where we can help. There's some things that we do take in house. We do have designers and writers and developers and social media managers and the like. There's a lot of things that once you're at a certain level, you need a subject matter expertise. Maybe it's an agency or an individual, but that person also needs a leader because your business needs proper representation as they go through their course of work. And you need someone who has an eye for keeping things like OKRs and milestones in tracks so that you hit your goals quarter over quarter, year over year, and so that you're scaling effectively. Makes sense. So it's really just deconstructing the machine and figuring out what the most critical element is at the, the day level. You know, it's going from year or even multi-year down to year and then quarter and then month and then week and then day, and then figuring out, going back to what we talked about in my book, Leaving Captivity, you know, in the activity qualifier section, is this something that I should be doing as the executive? Or is this something that should be delegated or outsourced or automated? And, uh, and if it's not an essential function for the executive, it's probably something you need to look at outsourcing to uh, a, a company uh, such as Strategic Brand Builders. So that's, uh, that's really the message, isn't it? Absolutely. I think marketing and operations, which you just spoke of, walk hand in hand to business profitability and scale. You sound like a RevOps guy. You're, you're, you're a fan of RevOps, aren't you? <laughs> I am. I am. Because I think that, you know, marketing can drive a lot of leads. But if the back end is uh, not structured in a way to properly utilize them, you're wasting a lot of money. And yeah. at the end of the day, marketing needs to create ROI. And that happens with systems and processes and, and a company culture of like a bias towards action and really like. Uh, being strategic about how you're deploying capital, human capital, and and everything about your business. So I love operations, love rev ops, sales ops, but uh, my home is marketing. So I try to stay in my lane when I can and and bring in the experts when it seems fit. Makes sense. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Obviously, visiting your website, uh, strategicbrandbuilders.com. You can book a demo there. Uh, you can have a, a high-level intro conversation um, and not book a demo. That's the wrong words. You're not a tech company. I'm sorry there. I'm not sure why I use those exact words. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of tech people on this podcast. No one's booking a demo with Trent Warner. You're going to have a, an intro discovery call. So, ha-ha, yeah. James. Funny there. Um, other than just having that, what's the best way for someone to become familiar with you and and, uh, and what you folks are doing? Do you have a blog? Do you have a Reddit, LinkedIn? What's your preferred way to connect with your potential future clients? I have a newsletter. The link is in my LinkedIn. I'm very present on LinkedIn. That's my social media uh, platform of choice. I think it's the one that does have the most trust, although probably not the best algorithm for people who have never met you to find you, but it is where I spend a lot of my time developing content. Makes sense. 
Okay. And there, there's I, only a few Trent Warners out there. So you look for the one with the marketing background and the B in the bio, and that's me. There you go. I love it, man. I promised you a, a 35 or 40 minute conversation. That's right about where we are. As we land the plane, I'm going to hand you the mic, man. Any last things that you want to talk about? Any topics we didn't get into that uh, you want to address quickly before we go? No, I've really enjoyed this time. I think that you do a, a great job, very thoughtful questions. And I really appreciate uh, your listeners listening and not bailing because I said SEO. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Now, th this has really been an enjoyable conversation, man. It, it's it's clear that you are a nerd for this stuff, that you really enjoy it, that it is is beyond just a career for you, that it's something that is internalized and, and means a lot to you uh, personally. So um, thank you for being here with us today. And I, I hope this is a, a benefit for you and your business that you get to some people reaching out saying, hey, let's let's have a conversation. Absolutely. He is he is Trent Warner, the managing director. That's his title. Uh, not anything else like president or CEO, but managing director of strategic brand builders. And this has been another episode of the Agency Freedom Podcast. Make it a great day, boys and girls. We'll talk to you again real soon. Y'all take care. <laughs>